pitching an idea, but more pitching something that I believe is the direction that we should be going, which is, uh, I think, something that should be uh, talked about in, in, uh, in the political sphere, uh, on a way in which we should be treating our new energy systems, and the ways we should be looking at it. But first, let's, you know, start with some history on energy, and start with some flex on how we actually got to this. Um, so we're going to be discussing today um, some uh, history to now. What do you actually want from energy? And we're going to be talking about the really surreal demands that we have on our energy systems. Uh, energy transition, which we're all talking about, and the immense difficulties that pair with this. Uh, policies and the European uh, emission trading system. And then actually on how to get there, uh, which is a, a proposal which I think that should get us at least in the, in the direction, a certain way to do so. All right, so we started off with sort of muscle power, this idea. You are know, using animal muscle power, and it's, we all know the downside of this is that it's a lot of effort, and you know that the power is also kind of limited, especially if you're not that big. Um, so we, we use some environmental power, some water, some, some, some windmills, and the problem with these, we also know, is that they're not always available, limited spots. So that's actually the energy scarcity that we have. And we see that limited power is a main issue here. Supply-based use, you know, it, the windmill only works when the wind's, blow, when, when wind's blowing, and low availability of spots in the first place. So this is something that we didn't really like, and that's why in the Industrial Revolution, when we finally got to the steam engine, it's why it gave such a boost to our economy. Because suddenly we had the first engines, we could deliver a high power, so we could do things that we couldn't do before, we could do it at a, at a relatively low price, we could do, had supply on demand, you could just turn it on and we'd have it, you know, especially with pumping in on mines that would be very convenient, there's a lot of water in the mine, you could just turn on the pumps and you start it. And you use combustible fuels, and we have a lot of those. And it's actually ridiculous how much pure energy somewhere is hidden into the earth, uh, you know, in, in big layers, and for us to easily extract, it's pretty cool if you think of it. And energy becomes really available, and more and more people can use it. So in contemporary use, we actually use power or petrol, mainly oil, for transport. We're not really going to discuss transport today. We're mainly going to discuss the electricity sector. And in the Netherlands and throughout Europe, we actually mainly use coal, coal and gas in uh, conventional steam cycles, which is you know, almost similar technology to produce our electricity. You know, uh, so what we do with power is power is not uh, a demand. It's not always equal demand for power. During the day, we use a lot more. During the night, we use a lot less. And that baseline of stuff that we always use is usually supplied by coal or nuclear power. We have a small power plant in the Netherlands, in Warsaw. And for the peaks, so the really high moments, we use gas because those installations are relatively cheap to build and to use for a couple of hours a day. So that's something you need to know. So contemporary energy demands. If we look at power now and we look at an energy source, what do we really want from it? And that's actually quite a big list. It must be abundant, so we really want it to be settled for at least a couple of hundred, preferably a few, a couple of thousand years. We want it to be reliable, so we always want power, and we want it to be there directly when we want it to be. It's actually that, that's a strange thought, right? If you want to have, a, you know, if you want to start a pump which is driven by animals, you know, you first have to span the animals in, get them walking. If you flick your electricity switch, it has to be there right at the moment to start whenever you want it. It has to be very cheap, and we're competing with coal prices, and they are really low. Uh, it has to be very clean, that's, well, I guess that's a new thing. We now want it to be sort of clean. Uh, we want it to be clean before, so for example, sulfur pollution, which caused uh, acidic rain, that's what we really thought it was disgusting, so we, uh, we outbanned it, basically, and every single power plant now has a certain filter that prevents this sulfur from getting into the air. And right now, if we say clean, we actually mean that we don't want it to emit CO2. Um, and we want it to be issue-free to some extent. We don't want it to use, like, all our arable land or use an immense amount of water. And actually this idea is that our current technologies do very well in most of these things, and the renewable technologies do extremely poor in all of these things except for cleanliness, and there's no price on that. So we talk about energy transitions, and what we actually mean is saying we want to go from contemporary fuels, from fossil fuels, to renew renewables such as solar and wind. And we've got a big path to go in there because the part of solar energy that we're actually using is incredibly small. But why transition? There's actually two reasons for that. It started off that we thought, you know, at some point we'll be running out of oil and gas and coal. And unfortunately, we're nowhere near that close to that point. Especially coal, we're good for a good 200 years. We don't have to worry about that. What we should worry about is energy security. 
And that's that, you know, right now the Netherlands is running out of gas. Not globally, but the Netherlands specifically. So we are getting more and more reliant on other countries. So that's a big reason that countries are talking about renewable energy. Additionally, we also talk about environment, and then if we say environment, we again just mean CO2 emissions, because that's what we're always discussing in the end. And if we're used less fossil fuels, we can do that with energy savings, or we can do this green emissions uh, production, or, you know, production that's going to produce CO2. So the challenge of transition, and I think this is something that a lot of people really underestimate, is that fossil fuels are extremely awesome at what they do. Uh, and this is, this is something that's so difficult to displace. This is an extremely high energy for both volume and for weight. There's absolutely nothing that gets close to petrol in that sense. Well, except for maybe nuclear. But um, it, it is, in, in this sense, it, petrol is so perfect and so safe in what it does that we're so lucky to have so much of it. The problem is we have too much of it because we're actually going to use all of it unless we do something about it. And that's what we can talk about it. So I supply a good 200 years if we're only looking at coal at current use. And it's incredibly cheap. And this is also a big problem, because if you want to compete with it, you have to make these prices. These are, these are just cost prices, the absolute lowest possible ones. You don't agree with them? Um, and you need, you need only very few space. We have about eight big power plants in the Netherlands, and each power plant takes about two square kilometers. And that's really it. And that's really all the space you need. So, you know, it's, I don't know, has anyone ever seen a power plant? You think you've seen one? Yeah, you saw one. We visited one. Like, you, you actually have to look for them, and then usually there are factories anyway. But they're they're not omnipresent and around us because they're they're you know we don't have that many and they don't take up that much space. It's actually really nice. And the only downside to it that we actually have in our list is that they do the CO two pollution, and that's it. And at the current price of uh, of CO two, which is due to the ETS system, is really really low. It's seven fifty. If it's supposed to be anywhere near to what it should be, it's about 100. So that's how far we are away. It's a factor like 12, 13. All right, so and now we talk about habits. Because if we're talking about transitions, yeah, we're going to be self now. All right, so it, we're, uh, we're talking about transitions. And actually, what we're right now doing is we're providing energy with our right hand. And this is an analogy that only goes for right-handed people. Um, and, and usually things we do with our right hand, we're really good at. You're used to doing things with your right hand. And if someone tells you start doing that with your left hand, you're annoyed because it's different, you think it's uh, difficult, and your, right, your left hand really sucks at it compared to your right hand. And additionally, infrastructure is really made for right-handed people. Like if you ever try to cut with your left hand using a right hand or scissor, that really sucks. So it's actually, this, just to make this change, just because it's a change, is already difficult. And then your left hand and your right hand, hand are sort of genetically equally capable of doing these things. So, oh, that's hard to talk. But in, in, in practice, I mean, you're supposed to, you were supposed to be, uh, to do similar things with your left hand as you are with your right hand. And already this transition is a really hard one. And then there's, you know, and, and, and this is how much transition we have to do. This is lower production. And then hydro, most people would call sustainable. That's arguable. Nuclear, very few people call this sustainable. And this part is what we call really renewable, and this part of that is solar. And we say that solar is the solution. We've got a long, long, long way to go before we're there. So we've got a lot of left-hand movement to be done. And what we're right now assuming is that that is going to happen automatically. I think that's a, that's a, that's a challenge, because apart from the left hand being the, left, be, being the hand that we're not used to, the left hand also has some challenges. Um, because current status. So they're underdeveloped, and that's a large part of lack of training, because it's left-hand technology. They're expensive, uh, there's limited hotspots, like some spaces for windmills or, or solar panels are specifically good. Uh, there's some social issues, most people don't like to have uh, big windmills in their backyard for some reason. Um, there can be side damages, there's a lot of environmental pollution that can still happen, caused by hydro dams or by biofuel projects, we've, we've heard of these uh, concerns. Um, and there, but, but most of, of, of all of these issues, I think they're solvable issues. Uh, there are issues that we should look at, but it's not beyond the scope of this presentation. What I do want to look at is something that is innate to most renewable energy, is that it's supply-based delivery, which effectively means that it produces whenever it wants to produce, and not when we want it to be produced. And, and that's annoying, because we're used to flicking that switch whenever we want it, and not and having power then, and not to use power whenever it's available. So if we go back to this windmill era, 
and the supply based delivery. And, and basically that comes down to this, you know, when there's a sun we have a huge peak in, in, uh, in, in production, but typically at night, as you can see, you know, solar power production isn't that high. <laughs> Uh, wind is slightly is slightly more stable, but still, wind isn't always blowing. And we have when we have a low like here, there's no power. In the current problem, you know, there is no problem because <laughs> look at the amount of uh, renewables that we're actually having. It's so small that it barely affects the market. But the moment that we would have a much larger share of solar, this becomes a bigger issue <coughs> because then we get these peaks that we actually can't focus for anymore. Uh, this is the case that we got in Germany. Uh, in uh, the fall, is that the amount of solar uh, electricity produced was so large that they actually had to sell it to the Netherlands uh, for negative prices, which means that the Netherlands got money to receive electricity from the German network uh, <laughs> for their prices. And that's at the latest record I heard, 25% penetration of solar panels in Germany. So it's only 25% of electricity is produced and they're already having these issues. And the more, the, the larger the market share is going to get, the larger this problem is going to get. So that, there's a limit on the amount of renewables that you can just put in your grid without having some buffers in there. And people call, you know, storage is a big solution here. And the question is, how are you going to pay for capacity? How are people going to say, you know, this is your reward for storing this electricity? Because what we would like to have is this optimum power source that would both be clean and produce whatever we want. That's capacity. And, and then talk about capacity loss. So did this problem with these peaks, to catch up these peaks right now, we usually use gas-powered fire plants. <coughs> and uh, whenever we choose who is allowed to deliver to the grid, we always say that renewables get the first pick. So we use any renewable that we can. And then gas-powered plants are typically used to fill in these peaks. So whenever uh, solar power falls short, we use some gas-powered uh, fire power plant to fill in the gap. But there's competition here. And when the amount of renewables gets higher, the, the profit that these gas power plants are making gets lower, so they move out. And in a sense, that would, in a way, that would be fine because we want them to be displaced. On the other way, we're also getting more polluting coal fire, fire power plants because their competition uh, position increases when the competition of the gas power plants decreases. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we don't want to happen. And there's other reasons, such as the shale gas revolution in the United States, which drops coal prices. But what we're seeing is a general trend towards more and more gas-fired power plants shutting down and actually people running again and going into coal, which is actually the most polluting source that we have, but also the cheapest source. Uh, and there's a big discussion going on. Should we pay for this flexible market? Uh, so basically, should we pay uh, power plants just to stay open so that we can deliver power in case that we need it? Uh, and what I'm actually proposing my idea is that we should incorporate this concept of general storage and flexible capacity into a market system, so it's automatically regulated and we don't have separate subsidies. All right, so government policies that we have so far. We have the EU ETS, which is the carbon cap and trading system. The theory behind that is that you can only produce so much. If you want to produce more, you have to buy emission rights from someone else. The practice is that everyone is getting free emission rights from their governments because they're afraid of the economic consequences and that the economic crisis decreased our production by so much that we're going to make all targets regardless because you know, the targets are not that big anymore because we had the economic crisis. Uh, so the ETS is not doing that much at the moment. And a lot of countries say that the